Thank you all for coming. We really appreciate it. Uh, this is a pretty important conversation, and we're glad that all of you are here to be a part of it. Um, we originally had a schedule that I was going to give some updates in the beginning, but we're going to move that to after. Um, and Kristen is going to introduce our, our guests here. So. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Kristen Auerbach. I'm the director here at PAC, and most of you. Uh, thank you all for being here tonight. We're, we, we're coming together to talk about, a, I think, a crucial community issue. And it all started in kind of a, uh, an, an interesting way that someone adopted a, a pet and it really, really, really was a bad match, pet in person. And it was a person who really couldn't provide the care that pet needed. And out of that came a conversation and a question that, that was just the tip of the iceberg. And the question that came out of that is should people have to share a permanent address in order to adopt should that be an adoption criteria because a permanent address is really or or a, some address is the only way we know um, we have to verify if someone has permanent housing and it, it got to be a pretty heated discussion I shared information with you I shared a post on Facebook they got lots of comments we heard exactly the same number of people on either side of this issue um, and both sides felt really struggling and so we we went back to the data and looked at what numbers we're looking at, and it seems that maybe four to seven people without permanent addresses have adopted a pet in the last year out of 12,000. And that is not to diminish the, the existing situation, but it is to say it's a fairly small number of people. Uh, but we know those are not the only people that face housing insecurity. So I want to take something off the table because I don't think it's going to be helpful for us to have a, de a, a debate over this permanent address issue. And I want to take off the table the, the argument over should we require, should we not, and say that if we leave here and decide that we, we as a community feel that people should have to list a permanent address to adopt, if we leave here feeling that way, um, then PAC, we, we still have to meet with attorneys because it's there are potential legal implications with that, but we as an organization don't have any objections to that um, if, we, if we make that a requirement of adoption. So having said that, um, driver's licenses are valid here for like, what, 100 years? <laughs> so it doesn't actually get to the heart of this issue, which is that people facing housing insecurity, whether they're actively homeless or not, are adopting from PAC. And in the old days of animal rescue, and some of you came from those days, I did, we would do home checks and home visits and background checks, and we would verify this and verify that. Sometimes we'd even do two checks on people. Um, they'd have to have a six foot fence, and they would have to have veterinary records, and there were all kinds of adoption restrictions. And in those days the, in the US, we were euthanizing close to 15 million animals because those barriers meant that people were not um, able to adopt pets. And there was there was this famous presentation that was done at animal welfare, com animal welfare conferences all over the United States. And this person got up and he asked everyone to stand up and he started listing off restrictions. Uh, do you own your home? Can, do you, um, have you ever had an unvaccinated animal? And so on and so on. And by, by the time he got done with questions, there were only about two people standing. And those were the only two people in the whole room that would have passed that set of adoption criteria. And so, I don't, I don't think we as a community envision going back to those days, but this conversation is about these adopt, adoptions where people are facing housing insecurity and it feels strange to us. It, it, it does to me too. And so I, when I was having this conversation with you, I don't feel like I'm a subject matter expert on this issue. Um, and so I wanted to invite someone tonight who is to speak with you that you could ask questions to and talk with. Um, and so we asked Peggy Hutchison, who's the executive director of Primavera Foundation. Do any of you know what Primavera is? Cool. We asked Peggy to come tonight, and she's so, so, so busy. And her colleague, Emma Hockenberg. Um, and, and, and she's Peggy is so busy, and this is a huge favor to us because I think this is an important conversation to Prima Bear and some of the work we're doing together. So, um, Peggy. Yeah. Good afternoon or good evening, whatever it is. Thank you, Kristen. Um, it's really a privilege for me to be here and to spend time with you. Um, I 
I'm going to make an assumption. You're all volunteers in, in some way. Um, most of you and Pat, can I speak louder? Okay. Some of us are I have more <laughs> in you. So just if I start fading, just stick your some kind of body part of it. Um, yeah. So uh, we at Prima Red love volunteers. We have over 1,000 volunteers. And um, what I love about, many things about volunteers, but one of the things I love the most is because, is that volunteers, you have a passion, and you care, and you're bringing greater love to our community. I mean, that's really what it's about. Um, so, and I'm also an animal lover, so at least we have a couple things in common um, here. So I really want to express my gratitude to you. And this is a really awesome turnout for people who really care and are, and are passionate about um, kind of our kid, kindred beings, um, animals in our community. So thank you for that, and thank you for your time um, that you give. Um, so, you know, just a little bit about me. I thought I was going to actually be a veterinarian one, one day because of, of my own passion and love uh, for animals and, and how much I've learned in my own life journey from animals and continue to. Um, it didn't happen. But one thing that I have dedicated my life to, and that's um, social justice and economic justice. And it's just part of my own DNA. And um, it, it's, it may, it's landed me at Primavera. Hi, come on in from the sea. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I've lived in Tucson in two incarnations. This is my second incarnation in Tucson. And um, one of the things I love about Tucson, is, although we kind of continue to grow, I say I grow because I'm also, you know, I love our land and all that. So, um, but that we're, we still are Tucson. And that is, uh, we're about relationships, we're about caring for each other, we're about caring for the earth, and really making this, continuing to make this a community that um, is distinctive and that it has meaning and it cares and it's kind. So, um, so I came back to Tucson in 2004, and Primavera, as you may know, was started by people like you volunteers in our community. We're really concerned about the growing number of people in our community that didn't have a safe place to call home. And they started um, in a neighborhood I lived in, in Armory Park downtown, and they started with a soup kitchen. And um, I think they quickly learned that although that was a great act of kindness, it wasn't really enabling people to become self-sufficient. And so they began, they then realized, um, well, we really need a shelter, so they, they started the first large shelter in our community that's still in existence for men. And then the organizations continue to grow in response to needs in the community. We don't create programs because we think they're cool. Um, that would really be disrespectful and wasteful. Um, all of the programs that have been started at Rio Veda have come from people in the community that say, this is a gap or this is a need. And um, we think that it, it's a mission fit for Prima Vena. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. We hope we have a good discernment about that. Um, but we've grown into an organization that's fairly large. And, and you can tell that when I say we have over a 1,000 volunteers, you can, that's partially because we have all these needs. So we work all the way from people at risk of or experiencing homelessness, all the way to home ownership, all the way to comprehensive community development, or actually building homes, or designing parks and we're working with folks in neighborhoods that have experienced disinvestment over many, many years. So that's a kind of a little overview. And we serve around, or we work with around 70,000 to 8,000 folks in our community every year. Again, that's through our continuum of housing, workforce development, neighborhood revitalization uh, services. And we have a community building and engagement component as well, where we work with folks in neighborhoods to uh, you know, bring to fruition what their dreams and what they want to see happen. So um, that's the really privilege that I have to be able to do that work with folks. And um, we developed a partnership with PAC maybe in the last year or two, I don't know. Um, and it's really been a delight to me you know, sometimes we think that oh, we've done the best that we can for our community, and then we're, we're humbly reminded 
or let me speak for myself, I'm humbly reminded, it's like, wow, no, you just started. And so this PATH partnership has really brought meaning to us and has meant a lot. And it's also challenged us as an organization. Um, because we know we can do more, but we're also at a place where can we, you know, if we're going to do more, we have to make sure that that, that more is going to be better and have a great impact on our community. So, um, you know, one of the things we've done is PAC has come, and some of you may have been part of that volunteer effort, to meet, uh, to, to be available for folks who come to our homeless intervention and prevention program downtown. And Emma will speak to that in a minute. Emma is the program manager. And, um, you know, that's really been a gift in many ways because, I, so I used to office out of that building, and now office in our training center in the city of South Tucson. But I remember being there, and um, folks would come in sometimes with their um, dogs, usually not cats, but sometimes with their dogs. And, you know, because I'm a dog lover, and I, you know, I have dogs, I, I thought about, wow, we could be doing more. But, you know, it just didn't rise to the top of my list. And also, I was like, okay, am I projecting onto this? You know, this isn't about me and my love. But, so it was really such a gift that PAC um, and we got together. And we're continuing to figure out what we can do. You know, we've had the um, immunizations. We've had folks that have come. Was it the Saturday? I think we did it. And I, I got to come and hang out again. Part of it is because I love animals. And it wasn't just people who didn't have a um, safe place to call home. We saw a lot of very low-income residents who actually came to, to, take, to take advantage of the partnership. Um, but PAC has also, um, you know, brought food and and the booties, which I actually need to figure out how to get for walking with my daughter in the desert. Um, you know, leashes and um, just kind of having that access. But I think um, Emma can speak more to it because Emma's there when when that, when you know the the um, folks from PAC come. But. Um, it's really added value to us because um, we want to be the best that we can for our community. And that's been kind of one more thing that we couldn't do on our own, but through partnership. As an organization, we always say our success <coughs> as an organization is directly uh, proportionate to the strength and, and the goodness of our partnerships. So PAC has been a really incredible partner. Um, you know, I'm going to introduce Emma, but what I, can, I, can, I guess what I've learned in my own journey in doing this work for many, many years um, of working on social and economic justice, and really equity of opportunity is what I call it, is that every time I think um, I know, uh, I can identify a person who is either experiencing or at risk of homelessness, I'm always wrong. Because everybody's story is different. And, um, you know, we're humans, and so we go through life crises. I've had it in my own life, in my own family. And, um, you know, it happens. And so, um, and so, you know, there are spirals and cycles. And um, especially now, with the economic situation in, in our nation, we're seeing a lot of people that um, maybe for the first time in their life are experiencing an episodic uh, an episode of homelessness because maybe they've gotten evicted in there. There are all kinds of reasons for that. For example, we have a lot of outside developers coming in from outside the state buying up uh, rental housing properties and then jacking the price of uh, stopping Section 8. So there are a lot of people who thought they had a safe place and have always had a safe place, and all of a sudden they're not because we have a, a crisis of affordable housing in our community. You may have seen Arizona Republic in an article the other day. And um, so here's a question for you. What do you think of the top three states who have the highest crisis of lack of affordable housing? Mm -hmm. California, that's oh, yeah. <laughs> You win, and I don't have a prize. What's, the, what's another one? Nevada. Nevada, second prize. What's the third one? Arizona. 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 Um, so awesome. So you already know that. So you know, we're we're there and certainly Pima County is, is very high up there. So um, it's something that we have to be mindful of and we're you know, we're working with others on a variety of strategies. But um, you know, when when family for the first time or individual 
you know, faces eviction and they have an animal, I mean, that's not just a crisis for themselves, it's, it's really a, a, a where they're going to live. It's a, a larger, um, you know, emotional crisis as well. So, so I can kind of be quiet. Um, I'd like to ask Emma to share maybe a little bit of an overview of, of what we do at our, what we call our HIP um, center. And, um, you know, I also brought uh, just a few of our annual impact reports propaganda. If you're interested, I'll put those up here afterwards. But then we really want to open it up for comments, questions, anything. Else. Hi, I'm Emma. Um, and I'm the program manager for our homeless intervention and prevention program, which we refer to as HIP. Um, and so HIP is a drop-in center for people who are living on the streets or are unstably housed. So we have people come in who um, are camping, who are sleeping on the street, who are in shelter, um, or they have used our services while they were any in any one of those situations and just kind of stick around. So um, we also serve as a point where people come in from the community to get assessed for housing in the community. So um, it's called an access point for our coordinated entry system. Um, and so we have people in all stages of housing come in um, to kind of figure out what to do next. Um, HIP provides, uh, we're a mail service, so we have people who receive mail with us. We also give out hygiene and food. We're a community food box kind of pickup spot too, and we have supplementary food to give out. Um, we also have case managers who work with people um, with whatever need they come in with. So that ranges from, I mean, we need, we're a family of 12 and we need a place to live, to um, I need help reading the mail. So it kind of, you know, it spans from very extremes. Um, we recently, I guess in the last year or so, have started working with PAC and they are um, at our drop-in center on Wednesdays. And they have been wonderful in providing um, not only just kind of basic supplies to um, our participants who have pets, but also someone to kind of check in with the pet themselves. Um, we have done a great job of connecting with the people who come through, but we don't know how to really connect with the pets other than, you know, we think they're cute. <laughs> so um, it's been really great having people um, from PAC come and, and learn and know the animals that we kind of have regulars that come through. Um, so, yeah. We need, we need volunteers for that program, and it's yeah. really a, 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 a parking way to spend it. Yeah, it's really great. And um, we have some, some dogs. I haven't seen any cats come through, but we have some regular dogs that um, our staff knows, and it's just really cool having, being able to watch our participants introduce their pet to someone new and be able to have a conversation and, and kind of show off their, their jackets or their new leashes and their new collars. And so that's been really great. Um, what have I missed? Those are all the, the top points. Yeah. Um, we also have a lot of our own rental housing that we own and manage that is affordable rental housing. And um, we have a lot of our residents who have various kinds of animals. Um, and a lot of them are therapy animals, and I guess that's an opportunity for us to learn that bond and the meaning of the value of that relationship and how it helps with health and, health and well-being for um, definitely the humans and the kind of animals too. So, questions, comments? Yeah. You just talked about the housing that you want, that it is available for people with pets basically. What about housing we don't own? How prevalent is it that they accept that? I mean, because you could face a situation where you're able to find some place for somebody that needs housing, but they don't accept that. Yeah, I'm going to let um, Emma answer that. One of the programs we have is called, um, well, several programs called Rapid Rehousing. And it's kind of a new way where the Department of Housing and Urban Development have changed how they um, provide funding for ensuring people have housing. And so that would be, you know, that's where it's scattered site. It's not the property <coughs> to be known. So, yeah. so we, um, 
many people we have come through our rapid rehousing programs have pets, and very, not very often do we find a property that won't accept a dog or a cat, just depending on various, but we have not had an issue housing someone because of their animal. Um, and yeah, and, and the programs will typically pay for pet deposits and um, if there's a pet rent, um, especially if we have some sort of letter connecting it as a, as a therapy animal. And that is very, we work really well with our behavioral health providers to kind of provide that. I have a question about your shelter. Mm -hmm. So I volunteer Sunday mornings at Z Mansion mm -hmm. and the program that PAC is interacted with there which is homeless and your homeless folks coming for food and uh, medical care there. And one of the things that I see as a challenge for those folks, a lot of whom are living on the street with their pets, is they'd like to go to a shelter, but most shelters, as my, and correct me, I only know what I've been told by them, but it's only Sister Jose's, um, that's a women's shelter that will allow them to bring their pets in, and everybody else doesn't allow a pet, so a lot of folks are sleeping on the street because they won't leave their animals. And I just want to say, as a person who's interacted with a lot of the, those folks, their animal, usually a dog, sometimes a cat, is more important than them to themselves. They take better care of the animal, really, than they're taking care of themselves. Um, and for that reason, then, they won't go to a shelter because that would mean they'd have to leave their animal somewhere, and they're not willing to do that. So I don't know, in your shelter, have you, do you allow pets, or are you thinking about how to do that? I know it's tricky. Question. Yeah, so I'll go ahead and answer that. Yeah. I'm just having a conversation yeah. about that today. Um, so uh, we have a hundred and hundred bed men shelter, and we have um, a drop-in facility and transitional housing, which is up to two years women's shelter. Um, so at the women's, um, they can have animals, um, and we're looking at. Um, partnering with PAC to have some, um, what do you call them? The yeah. tent kennels. The, tent the repurposed tent kennels. For some of the drop-in folks, because some of the drop-in folks, maybe, you know, if they could come and drop it off their dog in this case, to go have appointments and then come back and get it. Or even if a resident, you know, didn't want to leave their animal in their bedroom or, you know, whatever in the house, they would have a place outside. So we're working on that, and we have the space for that, and we just have to get our act together and do it. Um, for the 106 bed men's shelter, um, we've actually been in discussion about that. It's a pretty crowded place, and um, we're not, we don't have more, we don't own more land around there, so we're, we want to be responsible about it. So at this time, we don't. Now, the Salvation Army, no, there's a new uh, place opening, an opportunity center being opened up down um, I-10, and it could be that they will there be able to. And you're absolutely right. It, it's definitely a challenge. We um, love to do it, but we want to be responsible about it and make sure there's actually the space. And, and just one thing I want to say about the animals that, that, that I interact with that the homeless have anyway, they're highly socialized, and most are very easy to work with and be around people because they're out all the time. They're much better than the dog that comes from a backyard that's never been out before and suddenly goes, a kablooey, because, you know, I'm on a leash and I'm out in the world and I don't know what I'm doing. These, these dogs do know what, they do know how to be out in the world, they do know how to handle themselves, not all of them. But many of them are, you know, we're in a very crowded situation at Z Mansion, and they're wandering with their owners through, and they're very few. The smaller dogs sometimes are yappy, but <laughs> as always. But, but I would just say that on their behalf, that these aren't really problem dogs because they are so well socialized, and they're, for the most part, very calm. Not all. Also exercising a lot of part of the dip. Yes, right. No, they're very, I mean, they're used to stimulation. They're in the green right now. Okay, well, I was interested in finding out, I mean, you said you partnered for PAC and Premier as their partnering. Who initiated this program, this partnership? Was it PAC who approached Primavera? Was it Primavera who approached PAC? And what was the purpose of it? 
what right. is the purpose of this right. program? I can understand, totally understand, supporting people that have become homeless and have animals that they're trying to take care of. I totally support, you know, helping. What I don't understand is having people who don't have animals that are homeless and then saying, hey, you know, we can pick you up the pack, we can facilitate you adopting a dog, and we're going to help you take care of it and not not. What is the, what's the real purpose of that? I have worked downtown for 30 years, and I saw a lot on the streets. So yes, there's definitely homeless people and transients that care a lot about their animals. They're definitely there. There's also a lot who are mentally not there, or whatever, or don't care, or actually want something that they can dominate. And I've seen a lot of terrible stuff. So it's, to me, it's kind of like PTSD. I feel, actually feel like a trauma for me when I see these people out on the street with these dogs, especially in the summer. It's not a place they need to be. And so I'm wondering, are we promoting it, or is it just where we're helping people who already have the animals? That's uh, like the reason to get together is really because of what you just said, is how do we support people that already have their animals who may have a place to live or may not, but are coming to this one central location. I haven't heard anything about offering people an opportunity to adopt a pet. I heard that was happening. Yes, it's not true. Right. That's what this whole thing is all about. Right. Okay. There have been adoptions to people with okay. permanent addresses yep. and who are unfortunately homeless. Uh -huh. And that's what brought us all together. Okay. There are so a couple of incidents, and the four dogs that we can mention uh -huh. have all had bad experiences. So we're so adopting nice. between four and seven dogs a year out of 12,000, and the four dogs have had bad experiences. Why are we doing it? What's the point? If the people who are homeless, unfortunately, have a hard time as it is, why are we adding to their stress? Why are we adding to the resources that they don't have? That number one, we're breaking the county code, we're breaking the Arizona state code, we're giving an animal to somebody who can't provide food, can't provide shelter, can't provide adequate ventilation in our 110 degree weather in the summer, which is only going to get worse. If it's only four to seven dogs a year, why are we even doing this? I'd rather take those resources to help the unfortunate people who are homeless, who find themselves homeless, and have pets to take care of. Okay, can I respond? Yes, please. So I wanted to get back to, to you, your, your question. So um, our partnership was to figure out how do we bring our resources together and meet the need of folks who are experiencing homelessness and have animals and make sure that they're resources. That was the primary reason for it. And in response to you, um, it's really not my business to determine, or, or Prima Veda's business, to determine what criteria PAC uses to determine if somebody can adopt an animal or not. Right. Um, I think I think that's why we took that off the table. And if we decide not to adopt out, I think it's, it, it, as long as there is not a legal discriminatory reason not to require um, an address, I think that that's a fine policy for PAC to have. I don't think it solves the problem of that people in our community struggle increasingly. We just ran the numbers for evictions, um, intake due to evictions, and it was like this. In the last two years, it went up to here. I don't think it solves the problem we're worried about. And a number of the people who we have adopted to, um, who did turn out to be experiencing homelessness, did have some form of permanent address. So I don't think that gets to the issue um, that we are all concerned about. Uh, which is why I said, okay, we won't, we'll, we'll require an address, but still we're left with this problem. And that's why I asked them to come tonight, because I still think the issue remains of, of adopting pets who, to people who at least face housing insecurity. And, and I just want one more response. And I think what I've learned um, is um, that it's just so hard. The, the reasons that and how people that are experiencing homelessness are at risk of homelessness, um, and you can't really box them up and say how they treat an animal. I know that's that. not what I said. Thank you. No, that's, I know that. That's I'm, not just saying, I'm just saying we just have to be kind of mindful of that. I used to volunteer with Victim Witness many, many years ago, and I went to a lot of um, homes, very privileged, wealthy homes, yeah, and was horrified at how animals were treated you know, after. So I just know that that's something that we just want to kind of continue to remind ourselves. 
It's behind you in the back. Okay. Um, so a couple of things. Um, I've been, some of us in decompression have been working with a homeless individual. Um, he has gone to Primavera in the past, but he does not go consistently. Um, one of the things he brought up to us, because he does have two dogs, is that they have to have a muzzle in order to ride the bus. Um, the, do the dogs have Yes. Them. So, and that was one way, I mean, he is older, um, he's not, I mean, he gets around, but he's not, you know, studying anywhere. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, some of the stuff is like, can we start focusing on maybe doing stuff where we do muzzle training and say, okay, so this is a requirement for the bus. And, you know, if you have to take the bus, let's figure out a way that this can happen. Um, also, you know, really getting out there, too, is that, so he doesn't go to Primavera on a regular basis. So are we getting out there, like, I, you know, we check on him maybe at least once a week, mostly twice a week. Um, we're out there checking on him. Everybody sees him. Everybody kind of knows who he is. You see him every day when you drive to work. Um, and, you know, are people going out to the different parks and saying, oh, wait, you have an animal. Do we have flyers that we can give out to say, if you go to Primavera or you go here on Wednesdays, you know, you may be able to get your animal vaccinated or... You know, because one of the things he brought up to us is he had a female dog and he really wanted to get her spayed. Um, we assisted him in doing that. And we got her spayed and vaccinated and we got her license. Um, and that was a huge, he was so thankful because that was what his number one concern was, was he wanted his dog legal. Um, so, but having those kinds of things, do we have flyers that, you know, like when I'm out and about, you know, I know... Uh, huge extended family lives in the Julian Wash. Um, one set of the family has four dogs. If you go down and the in-laws live a little ways down, they have three dogs and then the uncle, he has two dogs and he lives about a quarter mile down on Julian Wash. So, um, because decompression, a lot of our things is that we are looking for lost dogs a lot. Um, so we run into, we're walking washes, we're meeting different kinds of people. So do we have a way to kind of say, hey, if you guys want some assistance with your animals, this is where you go, this is what you do. We do have a flyer. I think Bennett has those. And then we can also definitely provide okay. just hip info, like our information, uh -huh. so that that can be something that you give out if okay. you're interested in that. Yeah, absolutely. To, yeah. So just, and know. just as an FYI, the last Sunday of every month at Z Mansion is when the vet is there. Right. Okay. So we're always telling folks that in the hopes that they'll be there that day in shots, microchips, nail trimming. <laughs> yeah, like usually they like flyers or something written down or something, mm -hmm. that, you know, so they can right. kind of remember. To remember, sure. Um, so that was just, I was just, I, and that may be more of a pack thing than a Primavera thing, but. It exists and we can get it for you. Yeah. Thank you. We <laughs> used to have outreach workers, but, um, you know, our funding was well, good. And I don't mind doing it because I would love to tell people and give people information and, you know, we're out there. I mean, it seems like we're out there twice a week <laughs> these days, so... So, on a re related note to that, if, if we assume that resources exist, and there is obviously a population of, of homeless and dogs out there, you know, then it becomes how, a question of how do we, if we distribute those resources. So I, I have a couple questions like one, do you have any notion, and you may not, of what percentage of um, homeless with pets uh, are aware of and come visit you? I have no, I mean, I have no experience with the people, so I have no idea. It seems like mobility could be a problem. So there may be a lot of people who have dogs but are not able to get to you with having as June was talking about a you know, volunteer army, so to speak, 
is going out. Accosting homeless people and saying, here's some information. And, and maybe there's even a way that stuff can be delivered to them. Uh, what do you think of all that? So uh, before I pass it to Emma, I would say I have no idea. You know, every year we're required to do the PRT, point in time, count of people experiencing homelessness. And um, we, most communities do a terrible job across this country because you know, if, if families are couch hopping and surfing, um, they, they would be defined as experiencing homelessness, but we can't count them. We, there's no way we can cover the county, right? So, Emma, do you have any idea how many dogs there are? No idea. <laughs> yeah. Not a clue. That is something that we've talked about. Um, it is not something we currently ask, a question we ask people when they come into our drop-in center. But we have sort of played around with how to collect that information. Um, and one thing is that, that the population who comes into the drop-in center sometimes is a little bit weary of giving up information because they're afraid. And so um, we never want to ask someone, if they are very protective of their pet, we do not in any way want to scare them away with sort of asking. But we are sort of figuring out how do we observe and, and count and make sure that we have an idea of, of who's coming through with the animals and, and who might be outside of who's not coming into our center. And you know, you, I mean, there are people northwest, you go northwest, there's, you know, and you go southwest and east. I mean, it's, we cover a large area, right? Our Pima County region. So, One of the things we talked about at, at the PAC Act meeting was to try to get um, information about PAC and, and programs out to the community in hard copy that a lot of people don't have access to computers. So we were talking about going to the libraries, uh, going to, and one of the things we were think, I was thinking about was also the um, fire stations. And since summer is coming and there is this issue of people needing some relief from the heat, and a lot of times people will drop into the libraries and the board of, and the human, the health department has nurses at the libraries. Maybe we could, since we're a county organization in their county, we could do something with um, making a deal with them. You know, let the homeless bring in their pets. We will provide you with kennels for the pets to go into, so that they can get out of the heat. And maybe do the same thing at the fire departments to try to work our community together to help this population. I'm not against this population. I think we need to help this population. I'm on this subcommittee for outreach for PAC Act, but I think we need to think outside the box. And part of it is because of our weather, and we need to deal with these, not just the, the um, people, but their pets in this heat. And if we could work with our county facilities to try to ask them to help us with that. I think that's a great idea. And Think about it kind of spreading out, you know, where are there safe places, and I, that's a great idea. And, and, you know, that's kind of taking the asset-based approach, which is instead of, like, feeling sorry for ourselves that we don't have enough resources, as you were saying, stepping back and saying, well, what resources do we have that we maybe haven't, you know, thought about or encouraged, or how do we, you know, kind of pull, pull all of our resources together to have a greater impact, so yeah, great idea. Thank you. I was going to add to the conversation about the fire department and kind of engaging them. Um, TFD has a, a risk reduction program. They're kind of in the like third year of implementing, but part of that is a program called TC3. And it, they have um, outreach workers and uh, people who are coordinating care for people who are living on the street who are high utilizers of the system. And so they are already kind of looking at how to kind of help the population that's living on the street and so they would probably be really interested in kind of talking to you guys about how, what do they do when they find a pet, and and where do they go from there. So I think we were just in a meeting yesterday, I think, with them, and they 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 have someone that they've kind of followed from picking up on the street, and like just you know really high numbers of phone calls, um, who had a pet and was living in their car with their dog. Um, and they found housing for this person and they were able to stabilize the dog while the person got care in the hospital for an extended period of time and then reunified the pet and the owner and got them kind of stabilized. So they are, they are willing and wanting to have those conversations.
Are there other groups too besides the fire department that, that are helping, like, like the homeless people, like the uh, like Salvation Army, mm -hmm. they help home, and what other organizations? A lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, gospel Rescue Mission. Um, we have Sister Jose. Uh, Old Pueblo Community Service. And the whole, what we call, <coughs> Tucson Pima Collaboration and Homelessness. So it's really all Yeah. Is it listed someplace? Yeah, tpch.net. And the website is terrible. So, <laughs> <laughs> we're in the, the new one should be landing soon, but maybe we'll have a week or two before you go. Uh, it's Tucson Pima Collaboration and Homelessness, and it is um, all of the organizations in the community who... Oh, TPCH. Mm -hmm. Yep. Oh, TP. Yeah. They, um, all of the organizations in the community that um, receive some sort of federal funding to assist people's experience of homelessness. So there's a whole continuum of care. Do you think people would be more willing to answer a question like, do you know anyone with yes. a dog? And then just say, great, here's some yes. information. Next time you see them, give it. Yep. And it that is. would seem to yeah. disseminate information. The really staff and volunteers from PAC who are at, at our drop-in center uh -huh. have done a really great job of just like mingling with people so that they are able to kind of like Hey, like we have this. Come, come talk to us. Um, we have something for you and for your pet, and so it's a lot less scary that way. Yeah, part of it's building trust, and so if you're there, like I'm there every yeah. Sunday. Sylvia, who's one of our officers, has been there a lot, and they come and look for you. Yeah. And you know, you've asked. They've asked a question a week before. You found something out for them for the next week, and and then you can ask questions. Um, but yeah, it's a population that's very threatened, and probably rightly so, and so you can't just barge in and, you know. So we have back here, and then Charlie, and then Lynn. So, oh. Take her, take her. <laughs> she was first. Can you break, can you break, um, I don't, oh, sorry, sorry. Can um, you break it down, how, what percentage of the people that you work with are temporarily um, without housing as opposed to chronically homeless because it's an entirely different population. I right. Think. Right. Um, I can give a crack, but I don't know what yeah. I, mean, I, <laughs> I don't have an idea off the top of my head. I can find kind of from our most recent, well, not the most recent pick account. I can do it from last year's and I can get that information for you, um, but I don't know off the top of my head. Um, I, I want to say these are not numbers that go together, so they're from two different like sampling points. But one, I think there was in the last pick count, there was like 2,500 people that were experiencing homelessness, and then we have about 800 on our chronic homeless list. Um, but those are from different systems, so they don't necessarily cross over. And there could be people. And yeah, and our chronic homeless list is very—it's not clean, so it is not an accurate depiction of that. Usually, I mean, I. Um, and you know, chronic could be this and then tomorrow not. But um, you know, historically, it's somewhere between maybe 18 to 20 percent. Um, um, if you look at kind of a total population, but you have to be careful. Even our data systems uh, are problematic, as Emma said, because there's duplication. So we're not yet at a point, unfortunately. So for example, let's say somebody's with, with Primo Meta getting some kind of service, we're not a behavioral health provider, and they're maybe getting behavioral health at Old Pueblo Community Services, they're gonna get counted twice, it's one person. So that's that's some of the challenge. We just have to be careful about our numbers. Okay. I get my thank you. So in the red, thank you. No, I And I think the thank collaboration you. between PAC and Primavera is wonderful because all those homeless people facing homelessness with their pets out there, they should be supported. They should be supported to the hill because they have so many challenges to face every single day. And then PAC is stepping up to help them with those is absolutely great. My question is, I cannot understand, seeing the challenges that the animals and the homeless people are facing out there, why PEC cannot go that step and say, we won't add to that misery and adopt even more dogs out into the homeless community? 
especially as PEC on their website says that they're committed to find homes for homeless people. So, uh, homes for homeless dogs. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, the no, no. <laughs> it would be great to find homes for the homeless people. <laughs> The resources, uh, uh, if they're there, they should be definitely go to people. I mean, if someone is evicted with their animals, they had them from like baby times, like this one guy with his twin chihuahuas, they should be supported. I don't absolutely understand why we should add to the situation by giving shelter dogs out to homeless people. And that's a question that goes to Peg and not to you guys. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, the gentleman in the far back. Oh, no, I was going to say take her. That was, oh, my question was, <laughs> I'm going to take her. Okay, but I know you... Um, no, I'm good. You're good? Okay. Um, other questions? Come on, yeah. My question is, the find homelessness. You have to be really physically Maybe something could be set up that there is a contact and they have a list of volunteers that would be able to get this person up at a certain point in a certain time and deliver them to their so that they could get there. Yeah, I mean, we're, um, it's a great idea. We're uh, under-resourced. And, um, you know, we, I mean, we literally, we have, what, over 3,000 people on our mail. Yeah. That's one, one small program of our continuum. And we mainly rely on volunteers to help um, help us with that. So um, it's a good vision, and maybe we can bring it to fruition. But um, we don't have the you know we just don't have the resources right now. Just like we had to cut, unfortunately, we had to cut positions of people who actually went out in the community to um, to do to you know camps and other places to resource folks. Is anybody going out? Oh, Pueblo has. One person they have they have many more than that because they just started their new they have a new program um so I think they are up to four or five. So they have and then um La Frontera has three workers that go out into the community. And you know it's good because they're behavioral health agencies mm -hmm. and many of the people who are out there, not all of them, but a lot of them are people that need, um, you know, behavioral health resourcing? So it's kind of fit and set. It's a faster connect. I think somebody, yeah. So just so y'all know, like we have the partnership with Primavera where we're going out to support pet owners once a week. We're also going to Z Mansion. Um, we're going to Gospel Rescue Mission to support people who are owning pets and provide them the services they need. They may need. We're working with Sister Jose's. Um, Esperanza Escalante, we actually have a meeting with them next week. We are working with Old Pueblo Community Services. I met with Salvation Army earlier this week. So we're trying to work with as many organizations as possible to support the pets that are in the community. Um, and it's very informed by what people are saying their needs are. We started out by giving out duties and then people said they needed water bowls. So we're constantly talking to people and I'm trying to understand what resources they can get. If you do, we do have the flyer out of respect for the organizations on it, we're not just putting it up on the Facebook and saying, please come if you need help. We're doing grassroots. Right. So people who are already receiving the services are telling other people who need to receive the services. But if you drive by somebody and you want to give it to them, like, I can provide y'all with the flyer. We just don't want to, we don't want all of a sudden 100 people to come to Primavera because they saw it on our Facebook. So. Mm -hmm. Why do we have a hundred volunteers for PAC? Right, right. <laughs> 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 we, uh, Friends of Human Animal Care Center has a project or program called Pup and Boots in which they distribute um, booties and other supplies, <laughs> dishes and um, other supplies you know, to the homeless. We do. I'm, I'm doing this. <laughs> so um, we put out uh, bins. We started with Linda Marshall, and we put out um, distribution bins. And in, remember in the beginning, for yeah. all the puppet boots, and then we bought several hundred pair, mm -hmm. and then we actually buy the bowls and all of it. So people can still donate. Um, but yes, we fund it. 
Some of that I think still has some of the bins. Where are the bins? We should be checking them. I well, they, well, they they are, are. <laughs> put them on for a while, so people yeah. buy them and throw them in there. Mm -hmm. But you know, they didn't want it up constantly. It was up for you know a few weeks mm -hmm. or something. So we, I think periodically we could go back so and, and do that, so especially yeah. yes, summer okay. months. Yes. Probably not. Go. Yeah, that's that's the pump and boots is is why we're going after Primavera. That, that's that organ. That's that partnership. And we have a monthly outreach orientation. So if you want to get involved in going out and providing supplies, that's how you get started. With that. And, and I just want to say that the homeless are going to get pets. So Pat can make the decision to not adopt to homeless. However, you end up defining it. Good luck with that. Um, but they're going to get pets. And in my mind, as a person who's working with them and those animals, I would rather it was a pack animal. Because I'll know that it has a microchip, I'll know that it's had shots, and I know that it's spayed or neutered, and in good health, because that's how we adopt animals out. Um, otherwise, it's a dog that's been born on the street, passed around, people breed dogs so that they can give them to their friends, and those kinds of things. And I would rather it's a pack dog. Uh, partly because it gets one of our dogs good care. I haven't seen at the Z Mansion anybody mistreat an animal. Haven't seen an animal that looks hungry. I'm not saying they don't exist, but I think that's a minority. And so you can decide not to adopt to them. They will still have animals, and they will still need our care and help. That's okay, so I've, never, I've not come to the Z Mansion. I've not done any of these uh, organized outreach events. I have looked for a lot of lost dogs. I have um, answered people's pleas when they post things on social media. And I have gone out into the homeless community talking to people. And I have rescued dogs from them. And I have seen some things that are really not what you guys are describing here. Okay. I've seen animals right. being passed around just so they can be used for hand pan handling. Um, I've, had, I've had to pay bribes to follow people to this guy's house or to this person's camp to find the dog that I care about, that I help keep alive in the shelter for six months. Okay? Mm -hmm. And it is not, it it's not the houses. story that you're describing. But that so, happens no, in let houses. Me, let somebody else talk, please, okay? Mm. I understand that happens in houses. And I have a dog that stays at home by herself 15, 16 hours a day, not 20, because I need more than four hours sleep a night. But this is not always, this is not always a happy story for these dogs. It is a harsh environment here. There are a lot of drug users out there. You know, I, I haven't been to the Julian Wash, but I've been to a lot of the downtown homeless areas. And I would not, I would not ever feel comfortable taking a dog here, bringing it here, knowing that it's going to be cared for, or me as a volunteer taking care of it, and sending it out into that community to somebody who is in that situation. And I don't, I'm not judging these people. I, have, I try to help them when I run across them. You know, we have volunteers that have gone and helped these people, taken them to their hospital appointments and, and other things, help them bring their dogs back to PAC because these people cannot reach PAC for the support they needed after they adopted their dogs. So, you know, I'm really emotional about this because I've been out in these communities and I've seen some really awful things, not just with dogs, but also with children. And it's very, it's very, it's not just the, the happy stories that you're hearing. So I just wanted to say that there's more to it than what happens at the Z Mansion. Thank, Thank you for sharing. I mean, I think, again, it's not, not, it's not Prima Reda's role to decide what your criteria is. But, you know, I think that you're ha you know, if you can have a healthy discussion and discernment about, you know, what's the best criteria for anyone, no matter what, what their situation is, and I'm adopting a pet, you know, how do you go through that process and not put anyone in a box, but really do that discernment, and that's, you know, that's what's going to be, it's hard, right? It's, it's hard. I mean, I think all, probably all of us have young people that are very well, are, you know, very well housed and haven't treated their animals well. I'll tell you a funny story, well, not funny, but I used to live in um, Maryland, near D.C., and, um, and, you know, a bunch of us in the neighborhood would bring our dogs together to play. And one of them was a highway patrolman, and um, I found out later that his spouse ran an underground railroad where she would, she and her friend would find animals that they determined were not in healthy places, 
and would liberate them, right, and put them into their railroad to get them to a, a safe home. And, um, you know, was that the right thing to do? I have no idea. I, I was curious if her spouse knew what was going on. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's, just, it's, it's not, I think the issues that, that you all are, you know, making decisions about are, are really hard. And I think the challenge for all of us and all the work that we do is how do we not stereotype anyone? You know, how do we see each other as, as individuals and, and try to do the best that we can? We know that there's horrible, horrible abuse. Um, from you know all kinds of walks of life, and we, none of us want that to happen. Mm -hmm. None of us want that. So, I just want to say it's really we're kind of lucky because we're the county, and we don't have to make those judgments or those decisions because the county has rules and regulations, and we have to follow them. And putting a dog out um, <coughs> on the street um, without shelter without adequate medical care. These are all against the law. So it's not whether we decide it's okay to adopt a dog out to a homeless person. It's how do we figure out who's homeless? Because what I'm hearing is they can have all kinds of ID with permanent addresses and that doesn't necessarily mean that we know that they have a home. So I guess we that that's what I hear. I think we are we are almost out of time and I think we get we get into this territory of a very slippery slope very quickly. Um, and I I I really believe that all of us bring the, care about these animals deeply. We all do the work because of that. And we want to know that they're going to places where they will be cared for and loved. And I hear you all. When people spoke at the PAC Act meeting, I understand the concerns. I think we will probably end up with a policy that says you have to have an, a, 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 an address to adopt a pet. So the reason I preface the meeting with that is that it doesn't solve the problem of animals in our community being owned by people who face various life challenges. And some of those mean that they, they face temporary or long-term homelessness. And I think coming here has been I've never met a group of people who care so much about animals, but the thing about Tucson is I've never met a people who care a group of people who care so deeply about the people in their community. And these are deep issues. And I, if, if if we all decide that we are going to make sure people have addresses and if people are um, experiencing homelessness, we're not going to adopt them. Okay, but we still have this giant community. We still have this community. We're not. And it isn't, we have a part of our community where an estimated 30,000 dogs are still free roaming and need our home. We have officers going out to people's homes every day, dealing with animals that are left in backyards without food, water, and shelter. And I think the thing about this issue that's interesting is that there's a lot more visibility for folks that are living in public areas than there are in a lot of the, a lot of the hard, horrible realities that we're not seeing. Um, and these are complex issues because we adopt out every day to, to young students, right? That's, that makes me as nervous as anything. Uh, talk about transients. They're like going to be in like Idaho next week in California, the one after that. So these are really hard conversations. And I don't think the answer is like even putting more barriers in place or having no barriers. The no barriers is crazy. And what you've all said to me over and over and over again is our, our adoption process needs work. And I agree. I think we need a much more thoughtful, counseling-based adoption process that recognizes every pet and every person as an individual. And when you all criticize us, it's because we didn't have that comprehensive adoption counseling. And it really has very little to do with like a, a, a group of people in this room with folks around them. And I think that's where this group could really put the work in to say, can we stand by the placement of this dog or that dog or the one that we know is good. PAC has, since long before my time, adopted to outdoor only homes. Um, and I know that gives some of us heartburn. So I think we need to continue the conversation. But those of you who feel strongly, and Christy and Dr. Smith and others who feel um, really emotional about the issue, this particular issue, I think we'll find a resolution to that that we can all live with. Um, 
the larger issue, though, I think we have to continue the conversations. And the reason we started with all the homeless outreach, which was an initiative that PAC led, we reached out to Primavera, so as we looked around the community and we said, what is an immediate impact we can make on animals who are at risk of having medical issues, who not getting everything they need to be well cared for, and how can we increase the overall humane care in the community? And that's where we started. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. We've got to start it. We have, we know that our 55% of our intake comes from very limited areas of seven zip codes out of 70. We can map down to the street of where that intake is coming from. We have got to get into those areas and start helping people get spay and neuter vaccines, microchips, and making sure that they are also improving the standard of care for those animals. So this, this issue is kind of one that gets everybody's tackles up. But I think it's just the beginning of a, of a much more complex community conversation. So um, I know that there's lots of other things on the agenda for this meeting. And I want to thank um, you both for coming tonight. And if you have anything to add. Well, I, you know, I thought of something else that PAC has helped us with. And we tend to have a lot of cats that tend to create a lot of babies <laughs> in some of our areas. And um, I you know where I office our training center. And I have staff that have actually adopted these cats and they although I tell them they shouldn't they come in every weekend you know to make sure that they're cared for and they created a lovely area but one of the things we had to help from PAC was um, making sure that they don't create more leaves <laughs> and um, it's really you know it's just really great to, to continue, consider you all as friends and, and colleagues that are just making our community a better community. So thanks for your passion and your love and your care and your partnership. And if there's anything that Primavera can do to be supportive um, of, of the work that you're doing, I mean, we're already trying to do it, but I just want to express uh, our gratitude because it means so much to us. So thank you. Okay, so one more thing, um, Christian and the staff team have been so awesome to work with, so I want us to really celebrate. Thank you all, we have, let's see, a few more things, a half hour left. We're going to speed through some of these agenda items. Some of them we may just send out an email update afterwards because we aren't going to have to follow it. Um, so starting in April, adoption promotions, we are having our, I don't remember what we decided to call it, the flowers, like spring, mm -hmm. April showers. And volunteers are going to be picking buck dogs or cats, animals. And um, you write a bio on it, put a little flower up like we had with the hidden gem promotion, and those animals are going to be feed. So we'll be way. So no fee. Um, we'll send out more information about that as it happens. But that's the big adoption promotion for April. Um, I sent out an email the other day regarding the personal use of services and donations. This isn't any. This isn't something that we're having an ongoing issue with the volunteers, but we. It's a county policy, and we wanted to reiterate it to make sure that you know we don't get six months down the line and there was an issue with it. No it. So, volunteer-owned and people you know of kind <coughs> animals are not allowed to receive any services at PAC. That means the vet can't look at them. Um, we we can't have staff time dedicated to to the care of an owned animal. And any donations that come into PAC belong to the county. So those can't be used for your personal animals either. Uh, we're going to look into some of those donations that we can't use here and figure out how to disseminate them to other organizations that may be able to use them, but we're still trying to figure that out. If you have any questions about it, just let me know. Um, vaccination Vaccination clinics are different, but it's if, if we are doing an outreach event, you're, we can serve your animal, but general animals can't come here to receive any services, which involves you know, x-rays, medicine, staff time, any resources for that. Do you all have any questions about that policy? No. Okay. 
Um, we are starting a, well, we have been a leave them be messaging about stray kittens. Um, our intake went up by about 800 last year on the wrong kittens. Um, so we're trying to promote to the community, if you see a kitten that's just a couple days old, leave it where it is. Um, its mom is probably around. Keep an eye on it. Uh, put down cornstarch or something and see if you see paw prints through it. But the first instinct shouldn't be bringing these tiny little kittens to us because they are better off with their mothers. Um, so if you guys see that around, that's what that is. Tell people if they ask, they say, I found some kittens under a bush, what should I do with them? Keep an eye out and make sure the mother is not coming back before you pull them away. Um, thank you to everybody who filled out the survey and who's come to the feedback session so far. We have two more, one tomorrow and one next Saturday. And if you haven't come, I encourage you to come. We've gotten some really great feedback. <coughs> Friday? Okay. Um, it's on logistics. So um, if you haven't come to one, we encourage you. We've gotten some really great feedback so far. Once the feedback sessions are over, I'm going to send out a summary email with survey results um, and key points we've heard about in the feedback sessions and steps we're taking to to start working on some of those things. So I appreciate everybody's honesty um, and <laughs> complete, you know, continue giving us feedback if you if you have any. Um, staffing updates. Cesar in the clinic, today is his last day. Um, so he's leaving. Um, Cesar. Where's he going? I am not sure. Do you guys know He got an engineering position. Oh, nice. So it's really exciting for him. Oh. We are actually pretty good in the clinic, um, which we're going to be even better when I get to the bottom of my list of staffing updates. Alestra, I don't know how to say her name, is the new cat adoption coordinator to take over from Jessica Reck since she moved to community cats. She's starting on Monday. We have a new animal protection officer named Alex starting on Monday as well. Um, Dr. Winters in the vet starting April 8th. So we are all very excited about that. And we have eight, at least eight new temporary positions. You may have seen that up on our Facebook. Um, those are positions that we may start out with asking them to work 40 hours to cover in places like when somebody leaves the clinic and we need extra. It's going to be allowing us to plug some of these holes with the staffing shortages. Um, so we are collecting interest in those now. We're going to start doing interviews, and the hiring process for a temp is much quicker than a permanent county position, so hopefully we'll be able to get them in release. Um, last thing is, Gina sent out something asking if people would like to train to do microchips and work in admissions. Admissions staff has been very happy about people coming. Um, <coughs> it's great if you want to learn microchips. Um, seeing what admissions does every day, even if you don't want to learn microchips, but you just want to, to work with them. It was exciting that did today. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. So it, it's, it's cool to see what they do because it's not something that... Did you want to check? We have uh, the guard dogs coming. Oh. How many did she and Jack today? We don't have a lot of time, right? Um, but those are, are things that... You guys don't see what admissions does a lot, so if you'd like to, to shadow with them, train to do microchips, or just see what they're doing, let us know if we can get you in there. Um, we are going to have Ruthie come up to talk about the decompression program, what it is. And, uh. Hi, I'm Ruthie, and I am blessed to be part of the decompression program. And to stay on task, I have notes, okay? Okay, I only got a few minutes. First of all, the decompression program was asked for and created by volunteers in 2000. Um, the goal is to build trust and confidence so that animals can be adopted. Prior to the decompression program, because of behavioral uh, issues, socialization issues, a lot of these dogs would be put down and euthanized. As of this morning, I can say that since its inception in 2015, 1,266, but as of this afternoon, 1,267 have been saved and moved on to successful adoptions. Okay? You know, if a lot of people say, how would you just quickly describe it? I tell people, 
I get to watch dogs who only have known till now how to survive, enjoy, and learn how to live. That's what I, you know, I kind of describe it. That's my personal thing, okay? And um, <coughs> some of the requirements. Well, for me, I say the requirements are love, sweat, and tears, okay? Because, yes, there's a lot of compassion in how we work with these animals. There's a lot of love, massage, reiki. It's un a huge list of what we do. But that's not what it's about. It's a lot of work. Okay, I mean, on a Monday or Tuesday, I, on a, on a medium to full kennels, I do like 25,000 steps. Okay, so there's a lot of uh, sweat involved, lifting the dogs. Um, you'll see some of us, I mean, we're those people out there that um, we act like it's our two-year-old just learned how to use a potty chair because a lot of people don't realize, I didn't know this until Ed was teaching me and mentoring me that for a dog who's fearful and scared to bend over to take the treat off the ground or to go to the bathroom, they become vulnerable to attack and so they don't. So yeah, we're the ones that go, hey, honey, honey, hey, you know. And there's all the wonderful walkers that you know end up taking our dogs once they hit the adoption floor. We're like, yeah, you got him. So you know, that's some of the things that we do now. Some of the requirements are, of course, to orientation, dog walking one. They, you know, we would like you don't have to have an orange dot, but to have at least 25 hours of working with animals. To to and of course willingness and. Um, it's just it's an incredible opportunity. I can't even express. I don't have time to express what it's what it's done for me. Now, what what do we do? Well, we walk them, we feed them, we medicate them, we make sure they get clinic care, we read to them, we do massage, we do reiki, we do one on one, we do we have dog whispers. You know, it, because basically what it is is we work in a, a on a shift. There's two people on a team that comes in and. We get to work one-on-one -on -one with that animal in the morning, and there's an after and evening shift, and we get to customize it to their individual needs what that animal is. You know, we have animals that will come in. A uh, great example, uh, we had two puppies come in last Tuesday with their mother. As of yesterday, all three of them have been adopted or foster dog. Um, where it's a quick turnaround, okay? And there's some that take a lot more time. And the wonderful thing about the program is, of course, I'm not reading my notes, um, is uh, our goal is to get them adoptable. Now, I remember going to another thing where another woman spoke about three levels of communication. One thing about I can say about the DCOM team is we have lots we have really good communication. Uh, we have uh, communication not just with ourselves, but with the behavioral team and other walkers behind. If you ever see our decomp kennels, if you don't know where they are, we're now located in Harry's Haven, which I consider to be the presidential suite <laughs> of this particular shelter. And um, we're near the back. And what our dogs, you know, we don't have those little colorful dots. We have a big red dot, no A or SNA, because only um, the team members or staff are allowed to enter the kennels. So when we say we provide almost all of the care to our animals, that's what we do, because this is a trust building, you know. Um, I've only been with a team for like uh, five months, and before uh, anyone leaves, I did bring some handouts for, for, more, for more information, and I happen to keep a photo journal of every dog I get to work with. So you can, if you want to see some of the faces, and I bet you all know them, because um, one of the wonderful things is, is when they graduate, on those kennel cards, you know, then they go in and they get a blue dot or a green dot or an orange dot, you'll see that decompression graduate on there. Okay? Okay, when they graduate, yes, if we have time, they like to walk our graduates, but we really depend upon, as a family here at PAC, on the regular walkers who put in so many hours because these animals need to go past, you know, like the apron strings and now branch out and get to know other people. Okay? Now, in some situations, that isn't the case, and the dogs require some more um, care. And uh, so we actually find our own fosters, too. So there's another step. If they can't go onto the adoption floor, <coughs> and Kelly and some of the more experienced uh, team members, they work to find proper foster homes. Once they're on the adoption floor, we have, uh, Kelly says we're decomp for life. That's her, her saying. And what it is, 
is we have uh, handouts that are supposed to be given to the adopters. It has individual uh, needs of what a deprofession animal may need. Um, it also has a phone number so that the team could be contacted if they need more help. We have our search and rescue, as they were talking about <laughs> back there, okay? And I just joined that team, right? And I happen to know that homeless man. I'm more in love with him. But, um, and, and the search and rescue, I mean, we, it, I've seen them. Man, I, they, it's a little alert, you know, uh, 45 minutes, you know, blah, 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 jump the fence, man, we are out. And I don't have time to share this right now, but if anyone wants to know, we have a beautiful miracle called this called Sydney story. Okay, and it's about how far we continue to work with our dogs. Um, I don't think I hit all of my points here. Uh, if you send me a couple of things that might come up for you guys. Yeah. Um, regular volunteers. All of the decompression grads get our Martingale collars and leashes. So when they get adopted or they go to a foster home, you can always ask and make sure that licensing, because they are different than the Martingale collars that PAC gives. We actually give the ones that they snap so they're easier to put on the dog um, and to adjust. So we want those for the decompression dogs. Every single dog that comes through the decompression dog, uh, program will have a lunch bag with their name on it, their A number, in licensing. And those can be given to the fosters or the adopters. So if any of you guys, you know, kind of come in contact with that. And she's in charge of that, okay? And then also, uh, how we, we're, we're kind of self-supporting in some ways. That yes, our leads. slip leads, um, if you guys ever need slip leads. Um, Gina and Bonnie both have access to them. They're in the locker in the volunteer room. Um, $10 and for slip leads, which usually oh, yeah. is, tends to be a lot cheaper than what you guys can buy them for on Amazon or anywhere else. So $10 and the proceeds all go back to the decompression program because we pretty much buy our own treats, our own toys, um, the martingale collars and leashes. All of that is we don't receive funding from any other place here in PAC. So we are completely self-sufficient. <coughs> Another reason I'm standing up here today is because I, I'm very happy to say I'm the, the newest newbie. We just uh, recruited a, a new person on the team, but we have openings. Okay, um, our kennels do get full, and we want to continue being able to give that. And so we work in groups of two or more, and we do have some openings right now. And I'm sure as the program grows, you know that there'll be more. So if you're interested, be glad to answer questions. But I do want to leave you with one thought. Okay. Um, I was talking to my dad. You know, me and my dad were sitting back and we were talking about, he was proud of me, he came to the grand opening, you know, and, and uh, of the work that I'm doing here because I was saying, you know, daddy, back, you know, I was a little girl in the 60s. I remember when this place opened. I remember having to come here looking desperately for my friend's dogs, from our, you know, and praying to God my dog never got out because this was the place of my nightmares. Okay? So here I am a couple years from being 60. Okay? And now it's the place of my passion. Okay? And I was telling my dad, I said, you know, it's pretty, it's pretty amazing. And so I know that um, I've you know, only been with the pack for nine months, and there's a lot of people in prep search that have come before us and volunteers and have worked so hard to, to, uh, to get things accomplished here. But going from my nightmares to my passions, I have decided to remove a sentence from my vocabulary when it comes to pack. And that is, nothing's ever going to change. Because from my nightmares, my passion, it does change. You just got to keep, keep fighting the fight. And uh, any questions? Thank you. All right. Gina, do you have some quick updates? Do you want me to have quick updates? <laughs> Um, I just want to give you guys some updates on some events and stuff. Um, so, with Woodstock was like super successful. We had 10 adoptions, which was really great. Um, and they saw the volunteers that showed up for that. Upcoming adoption events Dogs and Donuts, March 23rd. Bookman's, March 23rd. 
um, Fast and the Furious, April 6th. We still need help with that. Um, I think that's at the Irvington Pet Smart. <clears throat> so for anybody that likes cars or has a cool car, you should go. Um, Tap and Bottle Brewery. <laughs> uh, April 27th, um, that's for a Mature Mutts adoption event. Um, I don't have all the details for that, but that should be fun. Um, and of course, the biggest announcement, um, who has signed up to the Volunteer Appreciation Party? That's it? Really? Oh, <laughs> Okay, well you guys are missing out then. Okay? We'll be there. Um, April 7th from 1 to 4 at the MSA Annex. I'm going to send out another reminder to everybody. Um, and then Volunteer Appreciation Week is the 7th through the 13th. Um, so I'll have food in the volunteer break room, different uh, hours of the day, all week, and prizes and all kinds of stuff. I'll try to make it fun for you guys um, to let you know how much we appreciate you and everything you do. Um, and I'll let you know. I was just going to say a couple outreach events that are coming up. Um, our Bombas and Banner. So Banner um, Health is having a microchip um, uh, event um, slash giving out Bombas socks. Have you guys heard of that? So it's kind of yes. like, yeah. yeah. It's kind of like Tom's. I like that. The Tom's shoes. Yeah, it's like Tom's shoes, but in socks. So they so pass like, out. All the sales go to help. Yeah. Homeless. Yeah. Yep. So they're going to get homeless yeah. folks. Those basic <laughs> socks. Um, and anybody who helps participates. If you guys want free socks, come help out. Um, and then we're going to. When is that? The 31st. Sorry. Come on, my socks. socks. <laughs> March 31st, 10 and 12 at Kino, the old Kino Hospital. Um, I think it's going to be out front. Um, but I'm going to send out another uh, piece of information on that. Tuberculosis. Do we have tuberculosis in here? Because we're going to do a run. <laughs> An outreach. Um, that's March 23rd, and that's, that's a county event. Sorry. Um, but those are always fun because you get to meet a lot of people. Um, and then we're doing a big career fair at Tucson Expo, April 6th. So these are all important um, events because PAC is going to be there, of course, and we hand out information, so important information that you guys talked about earlier. Um, that information will be handed out. People get to know about PAC. We get to have meet new partners, all that stuff. So outreach events are very important. So if anybody wants to join the outreach team, just email me. Thank you, Thank you, Dina. You're welcome. Thank you, Dina. Hi, guys. All right, so I'm going to try and go through these pretty quick. Um, we are starting to work on revamping our enrichment program, and that is going to be entirely reliant upon our wonderful volunteers. Uh, which one? Enrichment for dogs. Excuse me. Sorry. Sorry, I don't mean to offend any cat people. I'm talking about the dog enrichment program right now. Sorry. Um, and I'm going to choke up my mint. Okay, so we have two classes coming up in March and April. Um, March 29th, uh, which is a Friday from 1 to 2 p.m. And Friday, I don't know, when is April 20th from 10 to 11 a.m.? I'm thinking that's probably a Saturday. Yeah, I didn't write that down. Sorry. Okay, so Friday, March 29th from 1 to 2, or Saturday, April 20th from 10 to 11. Um, this is kind of the more comprehensive class that Tamsin um, did previously. For those of you that want to get started with helping sooner, you are more than welcome to come on Mondays and Thursdays, which I'm going to get into here in just a second. Um, they start, the behavior team starts their uh, enrichment at 8 a.m. if you'd like to come down and kind of learn the ropes with them um, at that time, you're more than welcome to do that. Then the classes that I just gave you, the information on are really more of a kind of bigger picture. It talks about the importance of enrichment and um, the types of, of enrichment things that we're doing now um, because it is a little different for those of you that might have taken the class previously okay sure absolutely um, so that's on Mondays and Thursdays at 8 a.m. in the behavior team office which is at the back of uh, phase two along that back corridor there um, <coughs> along those lines we've shifted we were doing pl uh, no play group on Mondays and Wednesdays in order to uh, do in kennel enrichment and after um, a lot of you gave us some fantastic feedback on why you thought that was a terrible idea, 
Uh, we have shifted to Mondays and Thursdays because we had kind of the same core walking crew on Mondays on Wednesdays. And so they were having to work so much harder on those two days each week. So we're trying to spread the wealth. Uh, so we are now doing them on Monday, no play group on Monday and Thursday in order to do um, in kennel enrichment. The reason why it's so important for you guys to get involved again in doing enrichment is that as soon as we can get some volunteers on board with doing those things that the behavior team is currently having to do, once we do that, they can go back to seven days a week for play groups. So that's really what our goal is. We want to get enrichment up and running again, and that also accomplishes the goal of getting them back to doing play groups all the time. Okay, any questions? Will that be on Goldschmidt exams? Um, what? The, <coughs> the enrichment classes are. The enrichment. Okay. They're in there. Mondays and Thursdays? No, no. I'm sorry. No, that's just if you want to come down and help oh, them out. That's sorry. something you could just come on down. That's not the okay. classes. The two right. classes are in there. Okay. If they're gone again, then we have a goal in logistics. I put them in there right before the meeting. And I did receive a question about play groups. We've gotten feedback that they're not always starting on time, or they're not and is exactly scheduled. I'm having conversations with that side of the, the shelter, and we're trying to figure out what's going on, trying to get everything nailed down. So we are aware, and, and we're trying to work on that. So. Yes. Um, OK, there's also a uh, CAP volunteer meeting on Saturday, this coming Saturday from 12 to 1. And we'd really like for folks to show up. Um, there's a lot of um, different things that we're going to be talking about that day, and including getting your information for all of you dog folks that are here, which I know are most of you. Um, we are going to start using a variation of the dog walker boards in the cat room as a means for cat volunteers to be able to start tracking the kinds of important things that they need to be able to do in similar ways that the dog walkers use the walker boards. And so we really want to get the feedback from those that are kind of in the trenches so that we can set these boards up so that they are the most user friendly that they can be and they're tracking the information that you guys need to know about. So if you can come, please do. It'll be right here. Um, group walks. We've got uh, a few more coming over the next month and a half or so before it gets hot. Raytheon is on uh, Saturday, March 30th. We're expecting about 50 people. That group has gotten smaller than what they're expecting. Uh, but that's okay, so that means we don't need another 15 or 20 runners. So we should be in pretty good shape for that as it is now. Uh, April 7th, we have um, a combined group from the U of A. Uh, sorority and fraternities are coming out, um, expecting about 75 people. So we still need some um, folks that can help with that. So here's a great idea. Come out and help that morning. Go home and chill out for a couple hours, and then go to the party after. Yeah. See, that'd be a full Saturday, right? <laughs> OK. Um, and then the last one is April 26th. It's on a Friday, so anybody that can come out and help with that, we really need help. It's really, really hard for us to get enough volunteers. Um, this group is uh, the Second Chance group. We've worked with them for the last few years. They're a fantastic group. Uh, they come out and they are um, folks that are have been previously incarcerated and are coming back into society. And there's different organizations around our community um, that is giving them quite literally a second chance. And so they come out here and it's part of their way of giving back that they're coming out and they're helping our community here at PAC. And they really are a fantastic group of folks. They have to do it on a Friday and that makes things a little bit more challenging for us to do a large group walk. It's generally somewhere between 100 to 150 walkers that come out. So we need a lot of help. Um, and then uh, Easter Sunday, normal hours that day. Um, we have a play group class uh, that Tamsin is starting up. It's gonna be very much similar to what uh, if you went through the playgroup training back in October with uh, Dogs Playing for Life, that's not necessary. You don't have to go through it again. You're more than welcome to sit through it again if you'd like. But it's going to be very similar uh, to what that class was. This is really for folks that either weren't able to do that before or you're new since then. Uh, we really, really, really want to start getting more of our volunteers um, trained and feeling comfortable and confident in getting into those yards and actually starting to do playgroups themselves. If we could have multiple play yards going in the mornings, we could cut the number of dogs that have to be walked at least in half, if not more. So that's our next big push with play groups, is we want to get to that point. Um, so that's on March 30th from 12 to 2. And then finally, Josh is back. Yay! Yay! Josh is really happy. Nobody else has to sit through another Bonnie Chameleon class, so yay. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, two of those was more than enough for me ever. Um, anyway, if anybody's having any problems with Chameleon or uh, their county logins, Please let me know. If you've already let me know, don't worry about it. He's working on that. 
But for anyone else that is having a problem and hasn't reached out to me yet, please do because now he's back so we can kind of streamline this and get it done more quickly um, and get everybody up and running. Cool, done. Yeah. 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 Well, I'm sorry. The um, uh, enrichment. <laughs> Um, can we, like, filling the cons, can we do them at home so we can spend some time with our families? <laughs> well, no, you don't spend enough time here, Gail. You need, you need to I really step, step up your game. Cons. <laughs> um, actually, cons are kind of a tough one because they're really challenging for us to um, sufficiently clean and sterilize. Um, so we're not doing those, like, not the way we used to do them. Oh, They're not okay. going to be stuffed full of all the goopy stuff that we used to put in there. Yeah. Um, just because they are so very challenging okay. to get clean adequately so that we're not potentially cross-infecting um, okay. other dogs. So that would be one of the great reasons to come either work directly hands-on uh, with the behavior team to see what they're doing, okay. or then come to the class either in March or April. Does that answer your question? Yes, okay. okay, anybody else have any questions? Gina does have a handout on enrichment. <laughs> Okay. No, Bennett, go ahead. Sorry. It's on the, it's on the, the website. That's what the word is. Um, and we can send out the link because apparently it's super hard to find. So um, it is 7, so if you have to leave. But I did get a couple questions sent to me ahead of time that I'd love to answer. Um, the gate to the RO area, since we had to make it off limits until we get a fence. Um, I will check up on that. I'm not sure where we are with the fencing. We are doing a couple fencing projects right now. Um, we're going to fence in the whole property, and I'm not sure where we are. It's taking a while. For like a month and a half, we were deciding how wide the fence has to be. So, you know, we've just hit some barriers with that. Um, the radios, uh, there was a question of, there was a comment on the Facebook about them breaking due to mishandling. There's not been issues with that. It was a misspeak. It was not the right word usage. Um, we know they're easily breakable. Um, they're breaking all over the shelter. Just the work, the, the type of work we have to do, they, they break. But just make sure not to glue anything back on. <laughs> and there's like a metal piece at the bottom of the little copper wire. That's the important part. So make sure, just watch out for that part. Um, the clinic updates, the, we know people have had trouble getting in and getting I guess service would be the best word for the clinic right now. It's seven, so my brain stopped working. Um, we are working on some of those procedures. Dr. Wilcox has created standing orders, so there's certain things we know we see all the time, and it makes the techs better able to, to respond to those, but you guys have to be waiting for the vet to tear themselves away from the trauma they're dealing with right at the moment. The Dr. Winters coming in should help with that, too. Um, once Dr. Winters comes in, we're going to start rounds again. We just discussed it in ops today, uh, and Sarah and Tamsin are working on getting our procedures back up for doing that again because it is really important. Um, and we are trying to make sure that everything that's identified in rounds, that this dog needs marketing, this dog needs more enrichment, is getting done very soon after it's identified, if not right then. So we may be asking for y'all's help with some of those things. Um, you had another question? How many vets are there? There will be three on as of the 8th. Um, we do have somebody that we're talking to who's still in vet school, so we can't make any promises because she has, has to pass her licensing first. But she's interested in coming once she gets done. So hopefully by June we'll be all good to go. Okay. Yes. On the ballistic site, it says that the cat care ends at 7 p.m. Mm -hmm. um, there's this big rush as the cats come over from clinic and I don't know why there's a shortage of staff quite often and we get off work and get over here and so often we're here after that. Why is dogs up until 8? It should be 8.30 across the board. Yeah. So is that, some, is that on the front page? Uh -huh. mm -hmm. All right, I will get that. Fixed. This meeting was, but that was. <laughs> You know, Patty, I'm just going to have you do this all. How about that? I'll teach you how to do we'll just Lisa, and you can come in and give me a hand with that. I actually Because I'm having a really hard time keeping that front page current. But thank you. I will get that. I'll get it changed. And I'm sorry. I did have a brain fart myself. So the feedback session is tomorrow in this room 
from 5.30 to 6.30, and it is on logistics. Sorry. See, I got something right. And I have one addendum about decompression. If you're interested in decompression and potentially joining the team, you can talk to me, you can talk to Kelly, you can talk to any team member. You could even use the decom fosters at gmail.com email address if you wish. Or And we also have a public Facebook page. With 1.2k followers. Yeah. Titled <laughs> Tax Decompression <laughs> Program. What did you think? Yeah. Thank you. If you want to get in touch with somebody from the decompression program to talk about getting involved with them and you don't know how to, you can reach out to Bonnie and Gina and they can get you in touch with them. Yeah, um, I have, as you and we're going to get So if, if we live in a dog or animal in the same gym or dog, mm -hmm. one of and they haven't been seen, we were going to say, who would the person at the shelter that we should talk to if the dog was getting first of all? I did, and now I can't remember what the answer is. Um, <laughs> this has been happening all week, so this isn't new. Yeah, <laughs> we've both been going back and forth with this kind of thing. Um, I will make sure to include it in the email update for this, and I'm really sorry, I, I can't remember the answer. What was the question? Who to talk to about a dog in the symptom book, and they're not getting help. Who to ask. It was if something's been reported in the symptom log and like, it hasn't been followed up on. The animal is getting worse. Yeah. And it's been reported multiple times. Yeah. And the cardio kind of like is kind of popping in because it's getting more urgent. So your specific person you can just talk to I would say for now, um, if you go to a, super, a supervisor, so Katie or Danielle, one of the shelter supervisors. Uh, they should be able to, to get you where you need to go with that, to get it looked at. Or Amanda, um, she's not doing exactly what she was doing before with that. The clinic is working with the symptom log, but she can still make stuff new. And you can always reach out to us. Um, and hopefully with rounds, that's the type of thing that is isn't that will solve that problem. In your formal environment, you have I actually have a comment. Mm -hmm. um, I'm kind of new to all of this, and I've met Bonnie and everybody. And I don't know if I met many of you or not, but I was a foster, and um, we had a dog that we found a home for. Unfortunately, he's gotten out. I just wanted to make, let everybody know that they had a uh, video sighting of him at El Rio Neighborhood Center. So if anybody's in that area, they happen to see him. Uh, his name is Shorty. I don't know if anybody remembers Shorty. Oh, yeah. like, what's that? The site, we had a sighting on Friday and also on Sunday night. So somehow he's hanging around that area. Um, apparently the, uh, the owners called and asked Pack if they could borrow a live trap. And they were, they were told that, that, they, that Pack will not provide a live trap because they can't say if it's going to be used on public or private property. So um, I'm not exactly sure what they're doing to try and, and get him, because unfortunately, if you guys know Shorty, he will not come to me. No. He's very skittish. So I've been in touch with the owner, and you have, okay. um, pet support reached out to you know some volunteers to help. Good. Green. So um, yeah, he's been spotted. We've got volunteers that have fostered the area with Wires. The owner is also really awesome about you know There's doing that. Nice uh, there was another spot, another sighting um, on the uh, golf course um, security camera, and so we put that lady in touch with um, the owner. So the um, the golf course. I talked to them last this past weekend. They were actually broken into. Oh, so um, maybe it's the same security. The, the, actually, the, they were broken into, and they said that the El Rio Center was also broken into, mm -hmm. and that's how Shorty actually was able to be in where they had the video cameras. Oh, you're hanging out with the fashion house. Shorty's broken into. 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 Shorty's broken into.
like liking men more than women. So I, 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 I just wanted to like German. It's down around. It's from the speedway. Yes, exactly. I, I, I drive it's it's a lot. Yes. What does what Shorty look like? He's a uh, German Shepherd mix, okay. uh, white fish color. Okay, white German Shepherd. Exactly. Yes. Okay. They call him Shorty because his tail is about half the length of a German Shepherd's okay. tail. His name is Bosco. <laughs> Thank you. And just for y'all's information, um, because of the trap thing, the pack is only allowed, we're not allowed to put traps on public property, so that's why we don't put them in the park when there are animals that they go missing from here. We have to put them on our property. And then when it comes to private property, it needs to be something that's somebody's monitoring because we wouldn't want a dog to get in the trap or an animal to get in the trap in the middle of the night. It'd be a business and nobody's coming back until you know Monday. Or something like that. Mm -hmm. So that's why we have the limitations on where traps can go. You guys have any other questions? I appreciate you coming in. This has been a very long meeting and I know we're all tired. So let us know if you have any other questions um, and thank you.